Our scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, found on page 843 in your pew Bible. Mark, chapter 8. Last week, our passage was verses 1 through 10. It's likely that verse 10 goes with verses 11 through 13. So I'll begin with verse 10, and then we'll go on to verses 11 through 13. So Mark chapter 8, beginning in verse 10, hear now the word of the living God. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanutha. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. May God bless the reading of his word to us this morning. You probably heard it said growing up, that Christopher Columbus set out on his journey to the Americas in an attempt to prove that the world wasn't flat, that it was actually round. The daring explorer defied all the wisdom of the geographers of the day and risked falling off the flat earth in order to demonstrate the truth of his claim. There's only one problem with this hero story. It's not true. Columbus's opposition to the anti-science flat earthers is nothing more than a myth. The source of this fable is Washington Irving's 1828 book, The Life and Voyages of Christopher Columbus. Irving, you probably know, wrote Rip Van Winkle, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Well, he decided to incorporate fiction into his biography of Columbus, with Columbus standing up to the backward religious authorities of his day in Spain. Irving even recorded a Catholic geographer saying, is there anyone so foolish as to believe in people who walk with their heels upward and their head hanging down, defying gravity? The fact is, during Columbus's day, thinking people did not believe that the earth was flat. One historian even goes further. He says, no educated person in the history of Western civilization from the third century BC onward, believed that the earth was flat. The idea of a round earth appears at least as early as the sixth century BC with the Greek philosopher Pythagoras, then Aristotle in the fourth century BC, along with many other classical philosophers, provided proof that the earth is a sphere. With very few exceptions, all educated ancient Greeks and Romans accepted the idea of a spherical earth. The same is true for Christians in the ancient world as well as into the medieval period. There are at most five church fathers that we can see arguing for a flat earth, at most five, whereas we have thousands and thousands of other Christians, other Christian scholars for more than a millennium who thought that the earth was round or a sphere. So at the time of Columbus's exploration, almost nobody believed in flat earth. In the five centuries since Columbus's journey, the evidence for a spherical Earth has increased exponentially. Our increased knowledge of the constellations, lunar eclipses, gravity, other scientific matters, in addition to our advancements in technology, allowing for circumnavigation of the Earth, GPS, the photos and videos from space, all of this provides overwhelming proof of the shape of the Earth. Yet, for a donation of $12, you can become a member of the Flat Earth Society. <laughs> the organization, quote, values scientific integrity and demands direct, conclusive, and repeatable evidence that our Earth is a globe. On the surface, it doesn't sound so bad. Direct, conclusive, repeatable evidence, that's good. But their conclusions are unfortunate. Quote, experiment and experience has shown that the earth is decidedly flat. Time and time again, through test, trial, and experiment, it has been shown that the earth is not a whirling globe of popular credulity, but an extended plane of times immaterial. 
despite the massive amount of evidence in favor of a spherical Earth. It's not enough for the flat earthers. No amount of evidence could convince them because they cannot be convinced. We see in our passage this morning an even greater denial of truth. The Pharisees demand evidence that Jesus is who he says he is. But no amount of evidence can convince them because they cannot be convinced. In Mark chapter 8, verses 10 through 13, we see Jesus refuses to prove his kingship to the Pharisees. First, we see the Pharisees demand. Second, we see Jesus' response. So first, the Pharisees demand. Verse 10, immediately he got in the boat with his disciples, went to the district of Dalmanutha. So you recall, Jesus is in the Decapolis region, the northeastern shore of the Sea of Galilee. He's just fed the 4,000. Now he leaves in a boat. Now, no one really knows where Dalmanutha was located. It's a mystery. But Matthew's account tells us that Jesus and the disciples went to Magadan, a town on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. So the important thing is he's leaving Gentile area and now returning to Jewish territory. Remember how he's gone out of his way to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. He's taking what he said from Mark chapter 1 to the other peoples of the region. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So he travels to the Gentiles to bring this message to them. He goes to Tyre to heal the Gentile woman's daughter. He goes to the Decapolis, healing the deaf man, feeding the 5,000. And these Gentiles receive him for who he is. He's the Messiah. He's the king. And in all of that, he's fulfilling the prophecies that the Messiah will be a light to the nations and will lead a new exodus, which includes both Jews and Gentiles, as he establishes his kingdom, which will extend to the ends of the earth. And now he returns back to Jewish territory after this great success in the Gentile areas. And immediately he's confronted by the Pharisees. Verse 11, the Pharisees came and began to argue with him seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. It appears that the Pharisees actually come to the harbor and basically accost him as he's coming out of the boat. They argue with him. This is not a discussion. They're not looking for a healthy conversation. We've seen in the Gospel of Mark, the Pharisees always bring conflict. They never have an interaction with Jesus that is positive or even neutral. It's always hostile always negative. They come to argue with him and to test him. The end of verse 11. The last time Jesus was tested, he was in the wilderness, being tempted, same word, by the devil. The Pharisees are on the side of Satan. They are of their father, the devil, as Jesus tells them in John chapter 8. So this is not a genuine inquiry. They're not seeking to find the truth about who Jesus is. This is a direct attack. There is an appropriate test for those who claim to speak for God. Deuteronomy 18, the great prophecy that a prophet greater than Moses will come. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth. He shall speak to them all that I command him. Whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how may we know the word that the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. So it's a simple test. If the words of the prophet come true, he is of God. If they don't, he isn't. And under the Mosaic law, he is to be put to death. This same test applies today. Whether it's Pentecostals or Charismatics who claim to prophesy, thus says the Lord, Or even our evangelical friends who get a word from the Lord, or they say that God spoke to me in my heart, sort of a softened version of prophecy. 
So whether you hear an audible word from the Lord that you then pass on, or receive direct revelation in some other way, a feeling in your heart, a still small voice, anything apart from Scripture, the standard is the same. Perfection. You get one chance to get it wrong, and that's it. This isn't baseball, where success one-third of the time gets you to the Hall of Fame. You have to bat a 1,000. No ups and downs. No time of more hits than misses. If you get it wrong one time, you're done. Now, the penalty for false prophecy today is not death. We're not Old Testament Israel. But the penalty should be vocational death. If anyone in our culture should be canceled, it's these false prophets. But they never go away. Whether it's Benny Hinn or Mark Driscoll, all these other false prophets, they always bounce back. They always find new people to deceive. So the Pharisees could have applied the Deuteronomy 18 test to Jesus. They could have compared what he said to see what actually came true. And if they had, they would have found out that he was right 100% of the time. He did bat 1,000. Then, of course, they would have to honor him as Messiah. But instead, they attack. And they say they're seeking from him a sign from heaven. Now, a sign from heaven elsewhere in Scripture is a supernatural attack. We see in Isaiah 7, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. A virgin birth certainly is a sign from heaven. Sometimes a sign from heaven involves apocalyptic imagery. Speaking of the coming destruction, Jesus says in Luke 21, there will be great earthquakes and in various places famines and pestilences, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. Then speaking of his return, he says in Matthew 24, then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now at this point in his ministry, Jesus has given all the signs from heaven required for someone to believe in him as Messiah and King. Overwhelming evidence. His authoritative teaching with divine power, his countless miracles, his casting out of demons, he's fed 5,000, then he fed 4,000, on and on and on, sign after sign. What more evidence could they need? But even if he acquiesced to the Pharisees here, even if he provided them another sign, it wouldn't be enough because they weren't really asking for a sign in good faith. No amount of evidence would be enough because their eyes have been blinded to who Jesus is. The Pharisees couldn't deny what he did. Everyone saw his miracles. Everyone saw what he's done. They do deny, though, the source of his power. Claiming these were not signs from heaven, these are the works of the devil. As the scribes say in Mark chapter 3, he is possessed by Beelzebul, by the prince of demons, he casts out demons. So here in Mark 8, again, they're saying, prove that your power comes from heaven and not from the devil. Ironically, though, they're the ones representing Satan, not Jesus. So this is the Pharisees' demand. Now we see Jesus' response in verse 12. He sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. So silently, he sighs deeply or a groaning. This is an expression of distress in a hopeless situation. Now, we're not told the exact reason for his sigh. It's likely he's sighing at the willful blindness of the Pharisees. They've seen a mountain of evidence that he is the Messiah, that he is the king, and yet they still don't believe. But I don't think the sigh reveals an angry distress in Christ. I think it's sadness. I think it's grief. The feeling you get when you try to help someone who doesn't want to be helped. You try and try over and over, but you can't break through to them. If you've ever tried to help an addict, you know this feeling a sigh of grief and sadness. He's trying to help them with the most important thing there is, eternal salvation, and yet they continually blind themselves to reality. And so he sighs 
with deep grief at their hardness of heart. They ask him for a sign, but he responds with a question. Why does this generation seek a sign? What does he mean by this generation? Well, it does refer to those living in that day, his contemporaries. But there is something more to this phrase. When we hear this generation, we should catch the allusion to the generation of Israel in the wilderness. This generation that came out of Egypt, that saw the signs from heaven, that Moses was a prophet of the Lord and yet rejected God's plan. So we see in Exodus 4, Moses answered, Behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, What is it that is in your hand? He said, A staff. And he said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, Put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside his cloak, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Then God said, put your hand back inside your cloak. So he put his hand back inside his cloak, and when he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, they may believe the latter sign. If they will not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground, and the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. So God is showing to Moses these miraculous signs that prove that Moses is indeed the prophet of the Lord. And then in the end of chapter 4, Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. The people believed, and when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshiped. So he performs these signs before the people of Israel, and the people of Israel believe that Moses is indeed sent from God. Then Moses goes before Pharaoh and his entire court and performs these signs, proving that he is from the Lord. Exodus 7. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, prove yourselves by working a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, take your staff and cast it down before Pharaoh, and it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers, and they, the magicians of Egypt, also did the same by their secret arts. For each man cast down his staff, and they became serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Still, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. So God gives Moses these signs from heaven, proving to Pharaoh's court that he is indeed the prophet of the Lord. But then Pharaoh's magicians come and perform the same signs by their secret arts. We see this, prophet, this, this process repeated again when Moses turns the Nile into blood. The Egyptian magicians do the same thing. So not all miraculous signs can be trusted as coming from heaven. The ultimate sign from heaven, though, comes in the Passover and in the Exodus. Exodus 12, the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. All the people of Israel did just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, And on that very day, the Lord brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their hosts. Pharaoh's magicians can't copy this sign. This can only come from heaven. And then God provides the sign at the Red Sea, Exodus 14. Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you. And you have only to be silent. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. So the people of Israel have seen all this, all the signs that Moses has done. They've seen all the plagues placed upon Pharaoh and Egypt. They've seen the exodus out of the land. They've seen the parting of the Red Sea. Despite all of this, this generation, just like the Pharisees, tested God. Exodus 17. 
All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? They're getting angry. They're getting angry with Moses, angry with God. But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt? To kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. They're going to kill him. The prophet of God. They just seen him do all these miraculous signs. He leads them out of Egypt. He leads them through the Red Sea, and now they want to stone him. So God actually then gives them a sign that Moses is his prophet. The Lord said to Moses, pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the quarreling of the people of Israel, because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? So God gives them the sign. He gives them a sign of Moses striking the rock, proving that Moses is indeed his prophet. And yet they continue to grumble, complain, lack faith. And so this generation dies in the wilderness. They never see the promised land. And now this generation of those living at the time of Christ are just like that generation in the wilderness. They're overwhelmed with signs that Jesus is who he says he is, testifying to the authenticity of God's prophet. But Jesus is even a prophet even greater than Moses. He performs signs greater than Moses' signs. His exodus is greater than Moses' exodus. He leads his people out of bondage, not just in Egypt, but out of sin and death. And yet they harden their hearts so they can't see. Now, in verse 12, Jesus basically takes an oath when he says, Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. Literally, truly I say to you, if a sign will be given to this generation, but there is no then clause, no consequent. If a sign, and you're kind of waiting, well, then what? But the consequences are left unsaid. The implication is, if a sign will be given to this generation, may God do such and such to me. We see a similar oath of the king of Israel in 2 Kings Chapter 6, may God do so to me and more also if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on his shoulders today. So Jesus takes an oath emphasizing that he will not accommodate this unbelieving generation. In Matthew's account, Jesus says, no sign will be given to this generation except the sign of Jonah. And then in Matthew 12, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The only sign from heaven that anyone needs is the resurrection of Christ. Irrefutable proof that he is the Messiah. But for those like the Pharisees whose hearts are hardened, even that isn't enough. When Jesus tells the story of the rich man and Lazarus, Luke 16, Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. The rich man said, no, Father Abraham, if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. The resurrection itself will not convince those who are willfully blind. For those determined to deny reality, there is no convincing. You could take members of the Flat Earth Society into space, you could orbit the Earth, and it still wouldn't be enough to convince them. And it's one thing to reject that truth about creation, it's another thing entirely to reject the truth about the Creator. Their blindness is exponentially greater because they're enslaved in sin. We hear many atheists say, well, I would believe in God if there was just enough evidence. If he would just prove to me that he exists, I would believe. 
the resurrected Christ could be standing in front of them and they still would not believe. He is just as present every Lord's Day as if he were standing with us. He's present in the preaching of the gospel and the administration of the sacraments, just as if he were standing here in the flesh. But no amount of evidence is enough for those determined to reject him. And so, verse 13, he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. Now, this isn't just the end of that encounter. This is the end of his public ministry in Galilee. Now he turns his attention away from the crowds, and he directs it to the disciples. This is also the end for the Pharisees and for all those in Galilee who have rejected him as king, as Messiah. No longer does he give them opportunity to believe in him. Their hearts are hardened and their fates are sealed. So let us not be like this generation. This generation in the wilderness or the Pharisees' generation in Jesus' day. Hebrews chapter 3, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. We can rejoice. We can rejoice because Christ has opened our blinded eyes. He's allowed us to see the signs from heaven that he is Messiah and King. And may we long for the day when he returns and welcomes us into that eternal Sabbath rest where we will forever eat and drink with the Lord. Let us pray. Our merciful God who is pleased to condescend to speak to us through your word, Grant us all grace, that we may not be mere hearers of your word, but doers also. Give us the grace of your Holy Spirit, that we may believe what has been promised to us. May we bring glory and honor to your name in all that we do, as you conform us to the image of your Son. In his name we pray. Amen.